it. To go anywhere in philosophy, other than back and forth, round and round, one must have a keen sense of correlative vision. This is a technical term for a thorough understanding of the game of black and white, whereby one sees that all explicit opposites are implicit allies, correlative in the sense that they go with each other and cannot exist apart. It is not at first easy to maintain correlative vision. The Upanishads describe it as the path of the razor's edge, a balancing act on the sharpest and thinnest of blades. For to ordinary vision there is nothing visible between classes and opposites. Life is a series of urgent choices, demanding firm commitment to this or that. Is it conceivable, then, that I am basically an external existence, momentarily and perhaps needlessly terrified by one half of itself, because it has identified all of itself with the other half? If the choices must be either white or black, must I so commit myself to the white side that I cannot be a good sport and actually play the game of black and white with the implicit knowledge that neither can win? Or is all this so much bandying with the formal relations between words and terms without any relation to my physical situation? To answer the last question affirmatively, I should have to believe that the logic of thought is arbitrary, that it is a purely and strictly human invention without any basis in the physical universe. To sever the connections between human logic and the physical universe, I would have to revert to the myth of the ego as an isolated, independent observer for whom the rest of the world is absolutely external and other. Neither neurology, nor biology, nor sociology can subscribe to this. If, on the one hand, self and other, subject and object, organism and environment are the poles of a single process, that is my true existence. As the Upanishads say, that is the self, that is the real, that art thou. But I cannot think or say anything about that, or as I shall now call it, it, unless I resort to the convention of using dualistic language as the lines of perspective are used to show depth on a flat surface. What lies beyond opposites must be discussed, if at all, in terms of opposites, and this means using the language of analogy, metaphor, and myth. But the fact that it eludes every description must not, as happens so often, be mistaken for the description of it as the airiest of abstractions, as a literal transparent continuum or undifferentiated cosmic jello. The most concrete image of God the Father, with his white beard and golden robe, is better than that. Yet Western students of Eastern philosophies and religions consistently accuse Hindus and Buddhists of believing in a featureless and gelatinous God, just because the latter insist that every conception or objective image of it is void. But the term void applies to all such conceptions, not to it. Yet in speaking and thinking of it, there is no alternative to the use of conceptions and images, and no harm in it so long as we realize what we are doing. Idolatry is not the use of images, but confusing them with what they represent. And in this respect, mental images and lofty abstractions can be more insidious than bronze idols. You are probably brought up in a culture where the presiding image of it has for centuries been God the Father, whose pronoun is he because it seems too impersonal and she would, of course, be inferior. Is this image still workable as a functional myth to provide some consensus about life and its meaning for all the diverse peoples and cultures of this planet? Frankly, the image of God the Father has become ridiculous. That is, unless you read St. Thomas Aquinas or Martin Buber or Paul Tillich and realize that you can be a devout Jew or Christian without having to believe literally in the cosmic male parent. Even then, it is difficult not to feel the force of the image, because images sway our emotions more deeply than conceptions. Furthermore, the younger members of our society have for some time been in growing rebellion against paternal authority and the paternal state. Along with this devaluation of the Father, we are becoming accustomed to a conception of the universe so mysterious and so impressive that even the best Father image will no longer do for an explanation of what makes it run. But the problem then is that it is impossible for us to conceive an image higher than the human image. Furthermore, we have accepted a definition of ourselves which confined the self to the source and to the limitations of conscious attention. This definition is miserably insufficient, 
for in fact we know how to grow brains and eyes, ears and fingers, hearts and bones, in just the same way that we know how to walk and breathe, talk and think, only we can't put it into words. Words are too slow and too clumsy for describing such things, and conscious attention is too narrow for keeping track of all their details. We can still awaken the sense that all this, too, is the self, a self, however, which is far beyond the image of the ego, or of the human body as limited by the skin. We then behold the self wherever we look, and its image is the universe in its light and in its darkness, in its bodies and in its spaces. This is the new image of humankind, but it is still an image, for there remains, to use dualistic words, behind, under, encompassing, and central to it all, the unthinkable it, polarizing itself in the visible contrasts of waves and troughs, solids and spaces. But the odd thing is that this it, however inconceivable, is no vapid abstraction. It is very simply and truly yourself. In the words of a Chinese Zen master, nothing is left to you at this moment but to have a good laugh. True humor is indeed laughter at oneself, at the divine comedy, the fabulous deception, whereby one comes to imagine that a creature in existence is not also of existence, that what humankind is is not also what everything is. All the time we know it in our bones, but conscious attention, distracted by details and differences, cannot see the whole for the parts. The major trick in this deception is, of course, death. We go to sleep at night. And then we wake up, and because the physical brain is still there, we remember everything that happened the day before. But if the physical brain decomposes, then we're what is called dead. And we say, well, that's the end of that. But when the leaves die and fall off the trees, or the fruit drops, next year, more leaves, more fruit. So in the same way, when you and I die, more babies later. If the whole human race dies, you bet your life. There are all kinds of things that feel that they're human, scattered throughout the multiplicity of galaxies. Because this universe is a peopling universe, just as an apple tree apples. But because we are unconscious of the intervals, we are not aware of the self with our conscious attention when conscious attention isn't operating. But still, just as you don't notice what your pineal gland, say, is doing at the moment, so in the same way, you don't notice the connections which tie us all together, not only here and now, but forever and ever and ever and ever. Now you know, even if it takes you some time to do a double take and get the full impact. It may not be easy to recover from the many generations through which the fathers have knocked down the children like dominoes, saying, don't you dare think that thought, you're just a little upstart, just a creature, and you had better learn your place. On the contrary, you're it. But perhaps the fathers were unwittingly trying to tell the children that it plays it cool. You don't come on, that is to say, on stage, like it, because you really are it. And the point of the stage is to show on, not to show off. To come on like it, to play at being God, is to play the self as a role, which is just what it isn't. When it plays, it plays at being everything else. <laughs>